this, this, the talk title is The Never-Ending Story, and uh, this, this, this is what can be the never-ending story. Forgiveness. Forgiveness was never very popular having grown up so long ago before nerdiness became sexy. His habit of studying alchemy didn't help much either. Not many people believe that you can really turn base elements into gold. But of course you can, and forgiveness proves it all the time by turning heavy, ugly hate into brilliant love. It took years of study and practice to get the formula down. One part willingness, two parts trust, and a big dose of, I don't want to hurt anymore. Forgiveness, like many nerds, still doesn't hang out with the jet setters or the ain't I fabulous crowd. However, he has had intimate conversations with the likes of Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela. One day, the world will wake up to the pain caused by blame, shame, and regret, and forgiveness will rise to the status of superstar. So, the never-ending story, the never-ending story is a story about forgiveness. Because like brushing our teeth or cleansing the outside of our body, forgiveness is a thing that we do and we don't do once. We should probably do it more than once. If you're sitting close to someone, you're probably glad they brush their teeth more than once a year, right? So it can't just be on some high holy day or when we talk about forgiveness. It's like it's got to be a continual thing just for spiritual hygiene. Um, there was a, a, a poem by Hafiz that I shared on Facebook, and it goes like this. Your medicine. If you have not been taking your medicine lately by saying your prayers every day, how can Hafiz seriously listen to all of your heartaches and headaches about life and God? Only he said headaches. How can you, you know, and I feel the same way. If we have not been doing our spiritual practice, how is it that we expect spirit to somehow lift us out of the hole of glum? There is always a ladder, but the ladder is through our spiritual practice. And it's not just prayer. Uh, I'm sure Hafiz was talking about prayer because being a Sufi mystic, which was uh, the mystical realm of Islam, or the mystical, I, you know, sister cousin of Islam, then they pray five times a day. Well, praying is good, and prayers of forgiveness are good. There's something that it's not just something you do once in a while, it's something that needs to be done and done and done. In fact, it's a way of looking at the world. Forgiveness does something to us. Forgiveness gives us new eyes so that we start to view the world in a totally different way. We start to seek to be whole. I seek to be whole. If you want wholeness, if you want to seek to be whole, you do forgiveness. If you want to see the world as wholeness, you do forgiveness. If you want to, to create or reveal wholeness in the world, you do forgiveness. So how many of you would like to do that? Great, so repeat after me. Why? Just because it's one thing to listen to me, it's one thing to read it, it's another thing to say it. So let's do this together. I seek to be whole. I seek to see wholeness. I seek to reveal wholeness. Now wholeness does not mean perfection like the world sees it. That's not that. Wholeness is the deep soul sense. There's nothing missing, nothing wrong. We can never live up to the expectations that we place on ourselves and society places on us. We, you know, incredible expectations about what perfect is, what human beings should be like, what women should look like, what men should act like. I mean, this is craziness, right? That's not what we're talking about when we talk about wholeness. We're talking about the deep soul sense that I'm okay as I am. And I start to see the world as it's okay as it is. Because the world has never changed through being chastised. It's only been changed through love, appreciation, and acceptance. Forgiveness is that means. Forgiveness restores heaven on earth, or at least it restores heaven in this earth. It restores heaven in your mind, and if you're not in heaven, you're either in purgatory or hell. I, I loved it when we went to Port, uh, Portugal, 
we uh, had an opportunity to walk through hell and purgatory and, and then climb up to heaven. It was quite exciting. Um, and what I've noticed is that, that even though people believe that was a certain place, when I'm in those places, it reminds me of the times when it's so dark, I don't know that I'll ever escape, that's hell. And then the times I know that this isn't good and I'm gonna find my way out, but I don't know when, and that's purgatory. And then there's when I see the light and I just go for it, and that's heaven. And that's, that's such a mental thing. Um, I wanna talk about forgiveness because I think it's so important. Actually, when I started to do this talk, I thought I could spend a whole year on forgiveness. There's so many intricacies to it. But I've only, uh, would you mind we just camp? What if we had food brought in? <laughs> You know, we just, let's just stay here till we're done. <laughs> How about that? But since I thought some of you would leave and then I would take it personally and have to do my forgiveness work, um, <laughs> I thought I'd boil it down into three categories. And they're very important categories. The first one is you must forgive yourself. You just got, you, you can't start doing anything else until you forgive yourself. There's an old Christian idea that Jesus suffered for our sins. I don't think so. Are you kidding me? He could walk on water. He didn't suffer so for anybody's sins. We suffer for our sins. And a sin is a mistake, and when you make a mistake, you suffer. Whether you're conscious of it or not, you set up your own obstacles, especially if you judge yourself for making a mistake. So we must forgive ourselves. And, and what I want to say about this is that the, G, the word that Jesus used, because some people want to quote Jesus, go and sin no more. Sin was a mistake. Don't make that mistake again. It does, it's not some sort of fatal flaw. That was made up a long time after Jesus came around. There are no fatal flaws. There is no original sin. There is a, there is a, a, a root mistake that we all make, and that is that we can be separate from our God and our good. And that, brothers and sisters, is a bunch of hooey. I just hooeyed on you. Anyway, so that's not, that's not good. But we have to every day recognize, well, this is what I do every day. You don't have to do it. What I do every single day is I examine my day as I'm either driving home or ready to go to bed, and I, I realize where I have flubbed up, where I did not meet my own expectations and I say, Father, Mother, God within me, make this all good. I, I did my best because what I know is that the universe works through our motivation, not our execution. And I so many times don't execute the way that I wanted to. I, didn't, I forget what I was gonna say. I, 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 I wonder why I went off on that tangent. It hardly, I, I, it's so rare that I drive home from a class that I'm not saying, oh God, I forgot this and this and this, so somehow make it good. Somehow make that okay because I know that I could have done better. And I don't want to go to sleep on that. And I know that, that the power of goodness can operate even through my flawed delivery. And this is important to know because how many of you have wanted to have a significant conversation with somebody that you love and it turned out all weird? <laughs> and you, you knew you didn't want to say that. And you didn't want that inflection. But if your intention was love, say, God, make it loving. I screwed up, but you don't. So fix it. I mean, really, toe to toe, fix it. You know my intention, fix it. And somehow it does. <laughs> um, the ministerial students have been doing talks and, and we have downloads or times to, to go over the talk um, afterwards. And I, I have yet to meet uh, or talk to a student that hasn't said, I wanted to say this, and I wanted to put it together this way, and I forgot all that, and I lost a big chunk, but they were fine. They were great talks. 
because the intention, the motivation, was to share something that would contribute to others, and so others were contributed to. We have to get off our own case. The other thing that can sometimes happen when we're in the process of forgiving ourselves is that we, we, we evolve to the place we know we can be better. I'm not the same person I was last year or 10 years ago. <laughs> Praise God. Anyway. <laughs> but in the process of that evolution, I will come up to the place where I want to be different. I want to be better. And I'm not yet. I wake up to the place that I wish I was more compassionate. I wake up to the place where I wish I was a better listener. I wake up to the place where I wish I was more articulate. I wake up to the place where I wish I was more patient. I wake up to the place where I would say, I wish I could be more imaginative and creative. Uh, yeah, no, really. And, and I want to be a volcano. I don't want to just do stuff. I want, to, I want to be the volcano of creativity. Huh, Marilyn? Marilyn's shaking her head yes. She's, you hold that for me, dear. Because there's so much that it, so I get to the place where I want this. And so that's when my prayer starts to shift and I start to say something like, Father, Mother, God within. And you can say anything you like. You can call it Holy Spirit, um, Allah, uh, my, my Hindu friend called it the big enchilada. <laughs> Yo, big enchilada. Well, he was Jewish. He was so weird. Um, he was a Jewish guy that, that started following a Hindu saint, and, and the highest thing that you could say to him was, you look just like Hanuman, which is a monkey. And he'd go, wow, thank you. Um, Anyway, he'd call it the big enchilada. You can call it anything. I don't, don't put words on it. It is beyond all names, but make it intimate. Because Ernest Holmes said that what we call God is a principle that becomes personal to us. So personalize it. Call it what you feel you should call it. So I say something like, Father, Mother, God within, make me better. Luckily, it's made me a better wife. I've actually been married for 17 years. It's a miracle. <laughs> and Mike Thorson, don't you dare say anything. I mean it. Because I see him over there going, yeah, it's a miracle. Anyway. So you might say something like, I want to be a better communicator. I want to be a better parent. I want to be a better friend. I want to be a better steward of the earth. We've lived on our land for 10 years, and I'm, we're not doing now what we did 10 years ago because I'm waking up. I want to be better to this land. This is Pachamama. This is the mother. This is the very ground from which we take all of our substance, and I must care for it. Now, I didn't think that way 10 years ago, but I do now, and now I want to be better. And Luna, I call him Luna, because that's what he called himself when he, a while ago. I remember Luna being in a class where he really wanted to be a better parent. And there was no way to have that happen except prayer, and it's happening, isn't it? my dear Luna. Now, here's the deal. That which is the very substance of our soul is pure spirit, and it is all that is good, and it knows how to make this personality better. Now, it might lead us to do this project or not eat those foods, but it comes from within out. So this isn't in self-improvement, self or we start redoing the outer structure. This is actually an internal transformation. Father, Mother, God, make me better. And that's forgiveness, because the mystical definition of forgiveness is that spirit gives forth itself through us. So we give up an idea of ourselves, and it gives forth through us. It gives itself through us. The next kind of forgiveness, the second kind that's so important, is that we need to forgive others. And there's two kinds of forgiveness of others. First of all, there's the petty annoyances. Do you know that Oprah 
has a petty annoyance? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oprah cannot stand people chewing gum in her presence. I found out by watching uh, Reese Witherspoon on a uh, late night show, and she was talking about being in the movie with Oprah, which was A Wrinkle in Time, and she said, and she just happened to mention, and she's like, like kind of in passing, oh no, did you know that Oprah, you can't chew gum around Oprah? She actually has rules <laughs> that you don't chew gum around her. And she said, but I didn't know, so I come in, and Oprah like, It's annoyance. It's just annoyance. We all have annoyances. How many of you have an annoyance? Mine is loud noises. I moved out to the country to not have loud noises. Do you know what it's like to live in unincorporated Snohomish County <laughs> in all of the summer? Because not only 4th of July is there the opportunity for fireworks, you have to practice before 4th of July, and then afterwards you still got all these fireworks. So it's a month-long celebration. And why do it at a normal time when most people are up? You have to wait for it to get dark, and it doesn't get dark till 10. So at 10 o'clock, when most people are going to bed, it's party time in Snohomish County. Not that it bothers me. <laughs> so you might be annoyed by uh, people talking over you, loud neighbors, bad drivers, you name it, you've got it. And I got this from Jerry Hudson. I call her Jerry B or Jerry Berry. And this was what, I'm not sure I have the words right, but this is the impulse that I got is the prayer becomes, bless them, change me. Bless them, change me. Why change me? Because I don't want my peace of mind to be rattled by conditions. I don't want my peace of mind to be rattled by conditions. Now, if it's really offensive, I can still stand up for it, but I'm not rattled. Bless them. Change me. And I realize I need to go backwards. Is it okay? Because I'm going to talk about the hard stuff. After this, it's hard. You ready? So let me go back. I want to go back to why we absolutely need to start and always keep, not just start, but to make it a perpetual habit to be forgiving ourselves. This little flaw, that little flaw, I didn't come do this. I, I messed up here. I could have done this better. Believing what we were told by other people. Um, it became really apparent to me when I was listening to Andrea Weatherhead last Wednesday because she told a story that I've heard before, so I'm going to tell the story again, and it's about how important it is for us to do forgiveness so that we let God give forth its love through us so that we experience that love because it's very difficult for people to love themselves. And unforgiveness just perpetuates that belief system and that deep-held belief that there's something wrong with us. So a group of uh, t meditators went to Tibet, or not Tibet, outside in India, because you can't go to Tibet anymore, and they were meeting with Dalai Lama and some of his monks. And they were talking about the metta meditation. The metta meditation is, may you be filled with loving kindness, may you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease, and may you be happy. Metta actually means friendly. The word is just means friendly, metta. May M-E-T-T-A. May you be peaceful and at ease. May you, may I be, who, bless, how does it go? May you be peaceful and at ease. May you be well. May you be something, something. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> and may you be happy. What's that fourth line? <laughs> may you be filled with loving kindness. Yes, great. All right. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. And may I be happy. Only in Tibet, they don't do it that way. Tibetan Buddhism, don't, they don't start with I. They start with you. It's a blessing. It's you. It's to you, you. And so this representative from the United States says, well, we always start with us, ourself, may I be, because many people in the United States don't love themselves. 
They have poor self-esteem and they need to start with themselves first. The Dalai Lama couldn't comprehend that. He's like, he, like what? He thought it was a translation problem. <laughs> he, he, so he, you know, he conferred with the translator and then he got together with his, with his monks and they got their heads in and they're talking. And the vision I have is like the minions when they go, <laughs> because when you hear a different country, country a, a different dialect and a different language, doesn't it sound like, you know, so they're all leaning together. And he, they, and he comes out and he says, we have no concept, no words for what you just described. But if people don't love themselves, yes, please start with the meta prayer for yourself. So let's do that. May I be peaceful and it, no, may I be filled with loving kindness. May I be well. May I be peaceful and at ease. May I be happy. You can tell that I just added that. Um, didn't put it in my talk. But this is one of those downloads that happen while I drive. It's very difficult to open up the thing and write it down. Anyway, so, <clears throat> so we need to constantly allow ourselves to not just do a meta prayer like that, but to, to let the dust of the day go. Let the disappointments of the day go. Whether they're about ourselves or the annoyances of others. Because what we're thinking about others comes back to us and it reflects us. After we have allowed ourselves to continue to work on letting go of our annoyances, then we can, we can go into the hard stuff. And the hard stuff is those things that we've all experienced because all of us on some scale, whether mind-blowingly awful or a, 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 a tow tripper have experienced some sort of abuse, neglect, abandonment, betrayal, and ridicule. We've all done that. We've all had that somewhere in there. I can honestly say I don't, I, I, to my memory, I've never been physically abused. I know, it is a praise God. Anyway. <laughs> But I do know that I have been verbally abused and didn't even know it was abuse, so didn't stand up to it. Little tears. Sometimes we're hurt and it's dramatic and sometimes it's just little tears in our psyche over and over again. And the forgiveness is needed, and it's needed even more. But the forgiveness is not to set things right in the ways of the world. The forgiveness is to heal the wounds and restore harmony. By heal, I do not mean that we return to normal. What I mean by heal is that we remove the hurt, but we keep the wound open. Now this is this is important. A heart broken becomes a bigger heart through which love can pour. Sometimes hurt breaks us open. There was something that I put on my Facebook page which was something I found on a window in, um, in Lisbon, I think. And I, I don't have it in front of me right now, but the gist of it was that where there has been a break or a wound, that's the place that the light shines out of. We become a place where light shows up and comes out. I don't know about you, but every time I've really been hurt and I've let it hurt me, like, like they thought that, they, they said that, they, I become more compassionate for people who are going through the same thing. I just, after I've done the forgiveness work, I'm just a more compassionate being because I know what it's like to be human and have to walk around in a world that is so filled with unskilled behavior. Not right or wrong, just unskilled. So the prayer then, the way of forgiveness then, 
the way to let the heart mend and the love fill us up and we become a, a place through which the divine can escape is this mantra. And I say mantra because it needs to be said over and over again. I doubt that you'll say this once and be, oh, I'm cool. <laughs> yep. He took the truck and the dog and emptied the bank account and took all my country and western albums, but I'm okay. Uh, actually, have you heard that joke? What, do you, what happens when you get your dog back and you're, oh, I, I don't know how that joke goes. Never mind. <laughs> but there's a really good country and western joke and somebody will text it to me. It's about getting your dog back. Oh, what do you do when you play a country and western song backwards? You get your dog back and your truck back and your girl back. Anyway, that's... <laughs> So this is a monster. It's something you say over and over and over again. And, the, and it goes like this. I love you. I bless you. I release you. I love you. I bless you. I release you. I love you. I bless you. And I release you. Now, some of you, when you start to do this, you're going to say, I don't love that person. I don't love that person. That's a lie. I can't, I can't say this. It's a lie. I do not love that person. I'm willing to not kill them today, but I don't love that person. And here's the, here's the thing, um, stop that. You do love them because what you are in essence is love itself. Now we're either playing out of our small self that keeps track of, of everything that's happened or we're coming out of our God self. And, and what God is, is love. So when you say, I love you, you're saying it from a very high place, not the personality. And you're here to remember that, and you know that. Whether you get it in this moment or not, I'm speaking to that which knows that you're pure love, and you're here to remember to love, and to love when it's difficult, because the world wants it to be simple and easy, and you're the ones that are going to change that by loving when it's impossible. And so you say, I love you. And then pretty soon you're going to feel it. And then pretty soon you're going to know that. And then pretty soon you're going to resonate that. Because that's who you really are. Because you are the place where God shows up when you say you are. Now God's showing up, but you're either acting out of your personality or your wounded self. And God bless you. If you're wounded, that's fine. That's what this community's for. This community is here to hold you and, and trust you and keep you until you remember who you are. In the process, you either speak from a low place or a high place, and the high place is you are love. I love you. A man I had to, I just wanted to throw up every time I said that to my stepfather in my mind. And I'd pull him in, my rabble. But pretty soon, you know what? Poor guy. I love him. Let's say it again. I would like you to pull up someone that you're having an issue with. Hold them in your mind and say, let's say it together three times. I love you. I bless you. I release you. I love you. I bless you. I release you. What you're releasing them from is your tight hold of your verdict of them because it wraps around your heart and it's very difficult to accept self-love when you can't be love. So the third kind of forgiveness is the transformational kind of forgiveness. You can be a mighty place of transformation in the world. It won't be that hard on us, honey. No, because as you know, it's like, oh, well, and some of you don't want to step up to this, and it's perfectly okay. But for some of you, you're ready to step up to this. How many of you watched Bishop Curry's talk at Megan and Harry's wedding? Yeah, I did. <laughs> it was hot. It was hot. He could have been here. He could have been anywhere. But here's the deal. Here's this African-American Episcopalian bishop from Chicago. And he is talking love. And it loves a power. And it's the greatest power. We can all use that love and we all need that love. And he's, he, is, he is preaching. 
preaching. I loved it. I was preaching. I was like, yes. Ah! And there's 500 faces. afraid to clap or acknowledge they were being moved. Wild. But it was televised. And so, so have, it, have you ever thought my message didn't get across? Maybe it just skipped them. Maybe it just whipped, because I'll tell you, I'm, I don't know who got that message in that room, but it got me. So this is where now we're talking real love. And the, one of the avenues for love, and it can be compassion, it can be service, it can be listening. Love can happen in many ways. But another avenue through which love flows, like a volcano going off, one of those fissures is called forgiveness. It's give forth through me. Make me a blessing on the earth. Let love be made real in my life. So I'll tell you a story. This is the story of the Buddha and the terrorist. A long time ago in northern India, Gahatma, who became the Buddha, came to a town of Saravati. And it was empty. I mean, it was, it, he's always been there before, and it's usually people all over the place. And he'd come for his m- noonday meal, because if you are a Buddhist priest, a monk, you just beg. And it's, and it's actually a high and holy honor to let other people support you. Get that, kids. So he's coming with his begging bowl, and there's nobody out in the street. And so he goes to his most loved, beloved, loving disciple, and he knocks on her door, and she opens the door a little bit, and she goes, pulls him in and says, you're not supposed to be here. What's happening? There's a monster in the town. Really, a monster? Yeah, it's a monster. Well, tell me about it. Well, his name, I got to get this right. His, his name is Angula Mala. Mala means necklace. It's beads. Angela was fingers. He's creating the beads of fingers. He kills people and takes their fingers, and he's beading them together. He goes, oh, that's kind of creepy. So I better go out and talk to him. She says, no, you can't go out. He'll find you. He'll see you. No, I got to go out. Besides that, I need to go back to my, to my disciples. They're in the Jetta, Jetta Grove. You can't go to the Jetta Grove because he lives between here and the Jetta Grove. You can't do it. Oh, I must do it. That's who I am. I don't believe in death. I'm not going to die. I ha- this person needs my love. I'm going to go. So the Buddha, having no fear of death, he walks, walks, into, uh, he walks back to his uh, encampment in the Jetta Grove. And he uh, starts calling out the name of Ang- Angula Mar- Mala. He's asking him to come and meet him. And uh, this is how it goes. Hmm, if I can find it. So, Angela Mara whispers to himself, I don't understand who this ignorant fool is. Uh, He seems to know my name, but obviously he doesn't know me. And sure enough, he keeps hearing his name over and over again, sweetly, sweetly said. How puzzling. He obviously knows my name, but he doesn't know me yet. So Angulera shouts back loudly, who are you and why aren't you running away from me? And don't you know I'm going to kill you without blinking an eye and thread your fingers into my necklace? And the Buddha says, yes, yes, I know who you are, but do you know that you could kill me and I won't even blink an eye? The Buddha paused for a moment and then said, I am always ready to die. Dying harms no one. But killing? Oof. How do you feel about killing others? Have you ever looked deeply into your feelings about killing? The Buddha finally looked at the man in front of him. Blood was dripping down from his fingers on his necklace, and his blood-stained clothes and sweaty body gave off a very disturbing smell. Aggression emanated from his heavy black mustache and his beard and his long matted hair and his, and his strong and fearsome appearance would have driven away most mortals. But the Buddha stood like a rock. I know you can kill me and maybe you will, said the Buddha, but when you kill, you kill none other than yourself because I am none other than you and you are none other than me. And whatever you do to me, you do to yourself. Now let me tell you one thing. You are capable 
Not only of killing, you're also capable of loving, and you're capable of compassion, and you're comp capable of change, and you're capable of friendship. And he said, oh, no, I have no friends. But I am your friend. That is why I've come to meet you and speak to you. You're my friend. I've given up friendships. I've abandoned the world. And Buddha, Buddha was pleased, because finally he was talking instead of using his sword. Why have you abandoned the world? Because the world abandoned me. Why did the world abandon you? Because the village abandoned me. Why did the village abandon you? Because the family abandoned me. Why did your family abandon you? Because my mother abandoned me. And why did your mother abandon you? Because my mother followed my father and she loved me. I know she did, yet she abandoned me because my father abandoned me. And why did your father abandon you? The Buddha now had a very low, soft voice. Because I disagreed with him and I disobeyed him and I rebelled against him and I wanted to stand up for myself and show my, follow my own path, but he would not let me. And one day I just hit him. I was angry with him. Buddha closed his eyes. He took a deep breath and then spoke in a soothing voice. <sighs> Were you so overcome with anger that you saw yourself as separate from your father? Was this feeling of separation the cause of the quarrel between you and your father? It's true, isn't it? That before you were abandoned by your father, you abandoned your sense of connection. Is it not true then that you yourself are the cause of this abandonment? I am your friend and I want to, you to recognize the cause of your pain and your problems, to recognize your sorrow and your suffering, and to recognize that there's no one responsible for your actions other than yourself. As it turns out, he goes on to describe his childhood where he was born to a low class, the lowest of the low class caste system. And actually, Buddha's, Buddha first showed up as a, as a revolutionary, um, someone who wanted to shift the caste system, and then it became another religion. But the caste system was awful. And when you are that low, you're called an untouchable because you only get the jobs that no one else would do, which is basically... Um, cleaning latrines and what they called um, field, field soil, no, night soil, because at night people would go out to their fields and that's where they would use it as a latrine and then someone else would come along and clean it up and those were the low casts. That's the only job they were ever given. And in the meantime they were ridiculed, tortured, and made to feel totally invisible and worthless. And that young man had rebelled against it. And the Buddha lets him see the error of his ways. And he actually becomes a dedicated disciple of the Buddha. But here's, here's the deal. This is the good news. This is the good news. Because that sort of thing is happening all the time. Violence is not new. It's one of the oldest stories ever told. It's right up there with the oldest profession. It might even be older. Nobody got that joke. Okay. But here's the good news. The Gospel of Jesus and the Dharma of Buddha and the Tao of Lao Tzu and the teachings of love of all the Sufis all teach you that you can let go of, we can let go of this chain of cause and effect. We can be free of it. But to step outside the, the circle of terror, we have to do something quite unreasonable. We have to forfeit vengeance and abandon all reasonable, reasonable expectations that the majority of our community, friends, and family will change with us. You need your spiritual instincts because the way out of violence depends upon a great and penetrating vision. You have to understand that you have to understand radically that terrorism of all kinds is insanity. Whether it's the work of a band of renegades, the work of a group called ISIS, or an, un young loved, an unloved young man with a gun. All of it is it's the effect of us not standing up and being the power of love. So 
So when we hear of those things that seem absolutely atrocious and ununderstandable for those who are called, you pull up your spiritual pants and you say, May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be well. May you be peaceful and at ease. And may you finally be